So now that we have the framework, and now that you have a little bit more about my background, we're going to jump right in with the four parts necessary, these four moving pieces, these four components in writing a Dungeons and Dragons adventure, working our way through, and this could be a very complex adventure that spans multiple worlds, literally perhaps years of real-time playing, or likewise, this can condense down to something to play at the table on a Friday night and have a good time. The ultimate aim, the ultimate aim, and this is what I've always strived for as a dungeon master with my players, bringing that passion, bringing that creativity to the table, is this very real idea that literally we're getting together to play D&D. We are stepping outside of space and time, taking away time from real life obligations, family, friends, work, school, and sitting together as a team. Let's create something memorable. Let's create an adventure. Right now, let's do something where we can run something on our table, tabletop, virtual, whatever the method of D&D, whatever the delivery is going to be, that things are set into motion literally years from now. You can think back as a DM. You can think back as a player and literally still see, literally still taste that adventure. I know I can do that with some of the great DMs that I've had the chance to play with over the years and dungeon masters that have inspired me, that have helped me to grow and become what I am in the game at this moment and interacting with the community. So that is the main goal. That's what I want to push out. And you'll notice here, it's just a splash screen. It's a couple of miniatures. I don't want to have any distractions. As you listen to this, as you listen to my words, try to visualize in your mind, that mind's eye, the things that inspire you, those images, that mythology in the D&D framework to kind of take down some notes or, or mentally make a decision as we work our way through this four-part framework of writing and delivering your D&D adventure. So for many of us, and this is the logical progression, we're going to get a little illogical here, but the logical impression is to approach being a dungeon master as telling a story. And in many ways, an important component, an important part of being a DM is a storyteller. I mean, you're wearing literally multiple hats. There's this idea that you're a rules lawyer. You're there like an analog computer. You're there to interpret the rules, enforce the rules, work with the players through the dice and through the narrative. At the same time, you're running all the monsters and the challenges and the story. You're communicating. You're facilitating. You're telling the story. And you're working with each player, making sure everyone's voice is heard. Working with each player so literally you can facilitate and bring their passion to the table. It's, it's a flow. It's a two-way flow where together we're literally building something. This is not me or this is not you as a DM sitting behind the screen holding court. I mean, you can run a game that way, but it's not very inspirational. And ultimately, one of the big secrets of being a DM is never to forget that you are a player there also. You are a facilitator, a co-creator with your players. So keeping this all in mind, this narrative, all of these moving parts, many of us start and sit down. We feel that inspiration. We have that vision. We have the voice. And we say, let's write an adventure. So we start at the beginning of a story. We view it as writing that first chapter. And maybe we have a framework of the narrative or the type of adventure we want to run. Maybe you want to do a classic dungeon crawl, or maybe you're inspired uh, recently visiting some architecture and being inspired by ruins. Let's kind of populate some ruins. There is going to be some sort of framework or an idea of maybe what you want to do. Bank that, hold that. But we're not going to start. Part one is not going to start at the beginning here. Part one is really part four. We are going to start using this framework at the very end of the adventure. The end is going to be the beginning. So I'd like you to, if it's possible, and maybe pause this vlog, or if you have an idea, if you're familiar with the Monster Manual or any of the Monster Manuals for D&D, we're looking at the primary Monster Manual, to pull that out. And I call it monster shopping. Go through, based on the level, the challenge rating of the adventure that you want to run, 
look through and, and look for something that captures your imagination. And this could be a, a classic dragon encounter. I mean, I love dragons. If you've had the chance to play D&D with me for any amount of time, give it like a month or two, whether it's tabletop, my tabletop group, or my virtual group, it, it's a good bet that at some point I'm going to throw a dragon at you. I, I love navigating dragons. I love bringing them into the mythology of the game. I mean, it's Dungeons and Dragons, and probably that dragon is going to be in a dungeon somewhere. I just, I just can't escape it. That's what captures my passion. So it could be a classic D&D monster. It could be a vampire lord. It could be a beholder. But also in exploring the monster manual, being inspired by the boss, the boss fight at the end. And, and I'm using my own terminology to build this framework. You're going to build it out and think about and come up with your own terminology. But we start at the end. Pick a final encounter. We want to end at we want to end the evening, starting at the end of the game. We want to have this buildup of tension as a dungeon master. And, and by tension, I mean a combination, an alchemical combination of excitement, mythology, wonder, suspense. We've been playing D&D for two or three hours, and now we're at the end of the evening. And it's winner take all a final encounter something is an anchor point for your players and you because we don't know how it's going to turn out you're that co-creator too we don't know how it's going to turn out to have something end memorable a final showdown at the end of the game so we start with a boss monster this is going to be the power behind the adventure the machinations the guile the exploration pick something that inspires you pick something that This monster ability looks cool. You know, I'd like to see how the party deals with it. I'd like to get some ideas on how to possibly play it and utilize it. Let's let's pick that one monster. And again, adjusted by by challenge rating at the earlier levels, at the lower D&D levels. uh, This could very well be an orc warlord at the higher levels. it, It could be a powerful undead. And of course, the higher challenge ratings, it could be a beholder, it could be a dragon. But be inspired, look through, or think in your mind right now, what's that boss monster? What's that end monster? What's that final showdown encounter going to be? Now, once we have that that framework, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, we're going to come up with a personal quest. We're going to come up with a, a reason of what this monster that that you've selected. So I'm going to share with you, no spoilers here, um, this campaign I just finished, and I'm in the process of rewriting aspects of it, um, developing a couple of things. So I'm not giving away any spoilers for those of you in my current tabletop game, but I'm going to illustrate this and use this as a chance to show you real time uh, these four parts in action. I started with this idea of a green dragon. I wanted a dragon that um, wasn't quite up there in the chromatics of a uh, classic kind of blue and red, but I didn't want to go with the lower levels white. I wanted to look at a green dragon and run that challenge rating 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in, in the lower mid levels. This idea where the players, they've got some bite, they've got some abilities, but they're not like total demigods, immortals yet. There's still some risk. There's still some reward. The, the, the final battle could go either way. So I picked a green dragon, Calithrax. I gave him a name. And now once you've picked your boss monster, what's the backstory? Um, there's this idea of, uh, for many of us, NPCs in Dungeons and Dragons, non-player characters. These are the quest givers. This is the king. This is the sage kind of giving you the map. This This idea that player characters outside of the player characters control interacting with them. Well, there's this whole ecosystem in D&D, the monsters, this this boss monster, this example of a green dragon, and hopefully you're narrowing down and, and picking your own boss monster so we can begin to build this framework together. There's a backstory. It, it's not just an excuse for treasure and experience and a stat block that you have to beat. Like this is a living, a, well, could be undead. Uh, this is an intelligent construct in your D&D universe. So the backstory of my dragon was it wanted to fly to a new realm in search of establishing a domain, establishing treasure, and 
setting up itself in a cave to kind of raid and get treasure. This, uh, the idea, this campaign started actually as an adventure to run over maybe two or three gaming sessions. And over time, this idea of building blocks, it, it morphed into something much, much bigger. So the backstory, depending on your creativity and depending on what you want to focus on, it could be one or two lines, really simple, get more treasure, do this, do that, or, or it could be even world domination or, or realm domination, you know, battling with gods, this idea that a dragon is going to replace Tachesis and, and replace Tiamat to ascend to the gods. So you have this, this little background, this motivation. This now establishes it in the framework. This is the very end of the adventure, when the players are fighting that green dragon or fighting that boss monster you picked. Now we're going to work our way back to part three, which if we were moving forward would be part two. Part three is now where you have the monster, you're building the ecosystem around it. So what the plans, the machinations of this boss monster put into motion, put into motion, what's, what's the discovery? There's going to be some minions, there's going to be some lieutenants, there's going to be other aspects of the game moving out into the realm. This is the first layer that the party's going to encounter. They're not just going to go up onto the mountain and, and face my green dragon. There's other elements that are working through the dragon, either directly or indirectly, to lead to discovery to the dragon, right? Because we're trying to create this tension. We're trying to create this, this sense of mystery. So I'm not going to say, hey, here's a dragon. No, something's happening. There's a disturbance in the realm. So how do we work that dragon in? And in this example of adventure, when the dragon landed on this mountain, landed on this cave, the force of that, and as it, it shaped the cave, it released underneath a crypt where there was a lich, a d dwarven lich, dwarven mines. And that, that power, that miasma, that undead, that undead magic spread and began to corrupt the immediate realm. So we're kind of going down the mountain, so to speak, and various orc tribes started to become zombified. Um, this is a chance to build out your narrative, right? Everyone's fighting orcs, but what about zombie orcs? And that spread moved out through the realm. So the idea is, as the players get inserted into your adventure, as the players get inserted into the adventure and fight these lower-level monsters, these lower-level encounters, part of that is an XP farm and bulking up, but also part of it is a direct pointer to something bigger and greater. And that is the suspense. And, and again, this could be compact and quick for a Friday night adventure, or this could be multi-layered in building out your campaign. We're looking at this framework. We're looking at this idea of four parts to write your adventure. Moving to part two. So we're getting, we're getting closer to the start of the adventure. Part two is now this idea of mystery, this idea of what's going on. Um, initially, when the players find themselves inserted into the adventure... It wouldn't be a very fun adventure as a DM, um, working through the NPCs, working through the storytelling if I said, okay, look, uh, there's actually a dragon on top of the mountain, and it was looking to establish a new domain, and it broke into that domain, and it released this kind of undead lich. Maybe it's working with the lich, maybe not. That could be another adventure. That could be a part two to the campaign, and it's spreading this undead miasma, fog, death cloud, silver mist, and it's turning the orc tribes on the hills into zombies. Like, no, the discovery is, as the players move in, there's these zombie orcs. You know, as they, they move into the, the wilderness, traveling around this mountain, maybe on another quest, or maybe they just find themselves adventuring, something is happening. We present the question to the players, working backwards, something is happening. You're dealing with it real time. You need to figure out what's going on in that capacity. This is, this is the mystery. This is the discovery. Getting the players through the adventure to answer the question for themselves, why? Not what's happening yet, but why is it happening? And that leads to what? And that leads to the boss monster that you picked. So now we have this, this framework of mystery, we have this framework of discovery, and we have this capstone of, that's part two, part three, part four, this capstone leading to the very, very end of the adventure, this, this final showdown. This puts us to what I call, you always want to try and bookend 
your adventures. And again, this could be a single Friday night, do it in three or four hours, or this could be a multi session campaign. Booking ending your adventures means you immediately begin the adventure with a call to action. Roll for initiative. As soon as I say that as a DM, you're like, wait, what's going on? You know, you're talking to the rogue, you're trying to figure things out. The room is secure. And Fritz is like, roll for initiative. Wait, what's going on? Right? Start. I, I, we could start it with a dice roll. Could start it with initiative, but but start it with action, right? Think of it as a movie opens. There isn't even the opening credits or, or fading into the scene. Like, no, there's a massive call to action immediately that snaps your players into the zone. There's this idea as a player, your character in the game is literally an avatar. It's your representation, your player personality. So I'm, I'm stepping around from the DM screen for a moment because this is important as a, a D&D player. This is an opportunity for you as a player to inject your personality, to create something, right? The, the background of our characters, the very character class we play, uh, the very development in terms of skills often reflects what we aspire to be, what we are, or what we want to play. So in working with that, when you sit down at the table as a player, there is a very, very real transformation. But that transformation takes a little bit of time. You sit down, we're ready to start. Immediately, you've got to deal with real life. You're thinking about that paper that you should have been writing all week, but you were doing the D&D thing. Maybe you're a little bit late because the trains weren't running. Maybe you were early. You're setting yourself up. You're getting your dice out. You're getting your character out. You're talking to your friends. I mean, the social aspects are important. And gradually, as we begin the, D- the game, usually it's the DM with a narrative, you get pulled into the game more and more, and that, that link begins to navigate. This idea where you become transformed onto your character. And about 10 or 15 minutes in to a normal D&D game, 10 or 15 minutes into a normal D&D game, you suddenly realize, like, I'm playing D&D. You know, you step back for a second mentally and you say, I'm playing d and I'm my character on the table. You have immersed yourself into it. And as a dungeon master, we want to keep that immersion. I don't want anything to break that immersion. The quicker I can get you into that immersion, this is, this is the bookend aspect, the quicker I can get you into that immersion, well, first of all, we've got more D&D time, but I can set you in that state. I can set you in that mode as a player where we're creating those memories together. So you're ready to play. I'm not saying don't do this, but my recommendation to, to inspire you as a DM, you don't want to hear me talk for five minutes. You don't want to hear like a summary of the realm or, or what's happened. Like we'll weave that in, but like let's immediately call to action. You're sitting in the inn recovering from the previous adventure and the doors to the common room break open. 20 orcs run in. Outside, a dragon flies overhead. Outside, giants are attacking. I'm not saying it's always combat, but it, it, could be, it could be something even as subtle as you're sitting at a table. I mean, everything happens at an inn, right? You're sitting at a table. You're recovering. You're telling tales. You're figuring out what to do next. And you realize that there's a pouch under the table. There's a scroll under the table or you move the table in such a way and a little secret box pops out with a rolled up piece of parchment, a map inside. Immediate call to action. What this does, and this is the, this is the, the bookmark. I mean, ultimately, this is what every adventure comes down to. We sit down to play d and I immediately want to pull you into D&D mode. Immediately. Full immersion as quick as possible. I do that by... The call to action. I do that by immediately forcing you as a player, as your avatar on the table, to make those decisions. That's the first bookend. Then once I've got you in that mode, so that's now we're going to work from the beginning to end. That's part one of writing my adventure, that that call to action. Now I've got you in that mode. As a DM, I've got you in that mode. I'm going to hold on tight. I'm going to try and keep you there, whether it's tabletop or whether it's virtual. I don't want to break the immersion. Now we move to part two and part three, which is the idea of mystery. Through that call to action, something is going on. Something is going on. Then we uncover the plot, part three. 
we're building the tension. So now you know a little bit more. And this could be through discovery of exploration. This could be through skill checks. This could be through navigating NPCs. I mean, the exact mechanics of your adventure, you'll work that out. Again, this is the framework. But now you feel like, hey, we've uncovered something. We know a little bit more. And then that leads to the final bookend of Boss Encounter. Final encounter, winner takes all. Always end the session on that note. Total heightened immersion. I could simplify it and say, start your game off with some dice rolling, roll for initiative, and end your game with some dice rolling, roll for initiative. So this framework, part one, part two, part three, part four, this is now the scenario, the adventure that I've created and that I recently ran, again, as an example, to inspire you, to show you that framework in real action, this is how it played out with the party over three sessions. They're making their way through the Forgotten Realms to the next part of their adventure. So kind of a standard quest. They think things are going to lead in. And uh, as they're moving through the forest on foot, they notice a roadside inn. And that roadside inn It looks pretty fortified. It's got some barricades. It's got some tables flipped up outside. Uh, The doors are covered. And they notice that despite being about 10 or 11 in the morning, a sunny day, there's um, a feeling of coldness in the air. And the sun is kind of blighted a little bit. And there's this mist hanging. And all of a sudden they realize there's this force that Um, compels them to move forward. Feels like you really can't go anywhere else. As they begin to check out the inn a little bit more, they're attacked by zombie orcs. From a distance, they look like regular orcs, but they're not really coordinated. They're not really moving, right? The idea is to leave little clues. Let the players discover, to leave little clues. Let them make some skill checks. Let them make some observation and, and build the clues. So we literally roll for initiative. That's, that's the first bookend starting out. Why is the inn fortified? What's going on? We're fighting these zombie orcs. Um, when they defeat that and they move into the inn as a home base, there's some NPCs there. Now this leads to part two, and, and we want to try and make this seamless. Again, part one, part two, part three, part four, but it's all one adventure. As we move into part two, there is the mystery. Something's going on. So we have some other adventurers in there. We have some commoners. And they basically fortified this and said, zombie orcs have just been pouring down the mountain, uh, attacking the inn, attacking everything in sight. They've eaten the horses. You can't go out at night. And the numbers and the food and the water is dwindling every single day. And, And essentially, you can only go up the mountain. You can't. There's just too many zombies everywhere. They're coming down from the mountain. We go up. So now through interaction with the NPCs and some skill checks and some back and forth, the parties have has some decisions, some very, very real decisions to make. And the mystery is to discover, because remember, this is from the perspective of the story. They're trying to figure out what's going on. They're asking questions. They're interacting. They're making skill checks. It's not that I'm lying to them as a DM. But I'm going within the framework of what's known by those adventurers and commoners at the inn. So they're going to have this idea of mystery and tension leading to the next part. So the players go up the mountain. I mean, I did have a group try to fight their way through the zombie horde, and they took a lot of losses. But ultimately, you start making your way up the mountain. And as they move up the mountain, they encounter some other undead. But now you get to the henchmen. Now you get to those serving the dragon, and there's actually two competing orc tribes. So this miasma from the crypt of the dwarven lich spread. we got a lot of zombies running around. One orc tribe aligns itself with the dragon and is serving the dragon, and the other is just trying to survive. So now the players have a choice. They can figure out, right, what are they going to do? Take on both tribes, align one, align with the other, and of course... The orc tribe working with the dragon, they're not going to say, hey, it's actually a green dragon, but one can see it's almost like they've started a cult because, you know, dragons are always starting mystery cults and things like that. Um, They want to be glorified as, as deities and rulers. So the players notice that some of the orcs, that the higher level orcs in the hierarchy, they're kind of dressing, um, in feathered scales that are green, 
Uh, they've kind of got ornate masks. It's, it's pointing up to something else is going on. Something else is going on giving that sense of mystery, getting the players to wonder. Then eventually at the top of the mountain, of course, there's going to be a dialogue with dragons. You ever notice how dragons always want to like talk about everything before it goes down? They want to like tell you how great they are. So it's a chance as a DM. That's another reason why I love playing dragons because you get to kind of give that, that puny mortal speech. You have no idea of the birthright of a dragon and, and, and set all that up for that final arrogance on the dragon's part showdown. That winner-take-all showdown. And that is the final, final bookend. So to inspire you, go monster shopping. Look through that monster manual. Pick something out that you feel like playing. Pick out something that's new. Write that backstory. Write that backstory focusing on the minions, focusing on the mystery, focusing on the discovery. And then at the very start of the adventure, figure out how you can begin it with a bang, how you can begin it with a call to action, how you can literally snap your players into avatar mode, into player character mode. And within this framework, with this, within this framework, circling back around to a very, very important piece of advice that I received early on as a dungeon master and, and one that I've tried to keep in mind and keep in account as I, I creatively create adventures and run adventures, there's room for all types of adventures. And as a DM, uh, the, one of the most important aspects is to have enthusiasm because you're a player too, and we need to deliver, and to have that inclusive nature and that nature of making sure that everyone's heard at the table. Yet at the same time, because you are the storyteller and the rules lawyer and the mystery creator and, and running all this, You need to make sure that you run the type of adventures that you want to run, the type of adventures that you want to run, the type of adventures, the story that inspires you, this idea of what I coin the vision and the voice. Your vision is a DM and says, hey, this is what gets me excited. Dragons get me excited. And and you can think about a million stories when you get excited. You look through the monster manual, you get excited. You're like, wow, I'd love to use these powers. I'd love to, to... play this type of monster. And that carries out in the voice of you thinking about the story, getting so caught up in the story that that part of your mind as a DM isn't like, well, am I getting the rules right? Do the players really understand? Do they like my adventure? When you have that aspect, when you have that narrative, you're not able to give it your all. We're losing out on the voice. So bringing out your unique player personality, your unique dungeon master, your unique D&D, Dungeons and Dragons personality, pushing that, focusing that, run the adventures, write the adventures, play the adventures you want to play. If that's 24-7 dungeon crawlers, then that's amazing. That passion will connect with the players. That passion will gravitate the type of players that want to play in your adventures. And using this framework to inspire you, using this framework to build out an adventure worthy of your time, an adventure that you can be proud of, and an adventure that after you run it, after you run it, as this recent adventure is an example, you're pumped, you're inspired, you're like, hey, I'm ready for part two. I didn't even have a part two planned, but as I was playing it, I have so many great ideas now, so many amazing ideas that I'm going to utilize And it's going to lead to part two, or it's going to feed back into part one, part two, part three, part four, and and retool and rebuild to an even greater, an even greater D&D experience.